Today's episode covered a wide range of topics, but the key thing that's central to it is artist independence. And we're able to sit down with none other than Steve Stout, who is the founder and CEO of United Masters, founder and CEO of Translation, and has been working in music and entertainment for decades now. This is actually his third time on the podcast, and we covered it all. We started the conversation talking about motivations and how you're able to stay consistent as an entrepreneur given the ups and downs of that lifestyle. Then we talked about translation, United Masters, artist independence, a bunch of trends happening right now, and how a company stays through all of the waves of technology waves, whether it's blockchain from a couple years ago to Web3 to where things are with AI now. Really fun conversation. Steve always brings it in these talks too. So it's a really great listen. Hope you enjoy it. Here's our conversation. All right. We're back with the Trap Little Podcast. Yeah, what's we got up, man? the one and only Steve Stout here. I think this is your third time on the pod. Really? I thought I, guess, I thought it was twice. This is my second time. We did one time. We was at Empire Studio there. Yeah. We did it virtual during the pandemic. And then we got this one. Oh, well, I'm a fan of it. I know I was on it very early. You were? Yeah, I was on it very, very early. Uh, I think you're doing a good job. Appreciate so that. Thanks for having me back. Thank you. Yeah. These conversations are always good. And I want to start this one in a place we haven't started others. I feel like we normally dive into the business, but take it a step back. You've been building businesses as an entrepreneur for decades now. How do you stay even keeled? How do you stay consistent with it, just knowing the ups and downs that naturally happen with building businesses? Well, the fact that I appear to be even keel is a compliment <laughs> because I certainly am emotionally attached to the businesses I built. I know there's, you know, the saying, don't be emotional about business, but when I'm building something from an original idea that I have, it's you birth the idea I'm emotionally attached to the success of it I mean, and the organization around it and the perception of it. So you've been through those tumultuous cycles, so you tend to not chase the highs or chase the lows. And that sounds good, but it is definitely harder to do that when you're emotionally attached than you know, understanding the theory that you should do that. And I think experience helps a bit, takes the edge off. But yeah, I would say to you, you just, like for me, I've been able to sustain the energy and sustain through the ups and downs through sort of expecting them and not chasing the highs. Like that's where the, the big mistake is when something great happens or a series of great things happen, you know, respecting it, but not chasing it. Because I believe that that's still not going to prevent the tumultuous time from coming. Because I think the tough part with that, and this is something I know I struggle with too, it's tying your own satisfaction, your own esteem at particular points with those highs when things are going well. Yeah. And it's great to say those things, but I know even myself, it's tough to be able to stay even keeled when things are going well, the phone starts ringing more. You start getting more opportunities, more looks for things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it becomes more hectic and then you have to hire more people and then that creates another set of problems and responsibilities. and. Look, building a business isn't easy. I, I said it on the shop, you know, that the biggest mistake that I see is the glorification of entrepreneurs. Like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. So therefore, like, you know, the sacrifice that it requires to be able to know that failure is imminent or success is imminent, that you may have an idea and you can go years without realizing the opportunity and it may go to somebody else. People ask me, how do I do it? And, you know, I'm here in San Francisco. I was, you know, in L.A. the day before that. I was in Miami the day before that. The day before that, I was in L.A. again. It's like, it just keeps going. And like, you know, not seeing your family and, and sacrificing some of the comforts of home or the comforts that you have of a routine is also part of the sacrifice. So it's not easy. And you have to really be committed to it. It almost has to be your A plan, your B plan, your C plan is that plan. Like you won't find joy or fulfillment in doing anything else. At least that's how I feel. Yeah, I think a lot of it's accepting those trade-offs and knowing that you can't do it all. I think I've heard you talk about this on the shop as well, whether it's so-and-so has the birthday party, so-and-so has the this, and yeah, it's great if you can line up and do those things, but 
you've chosen this life to be able to be in LA, be in Miami, be in New York and back to back days. And yeah. doing that requires this type of commitment to it. And you can't do everything. Yeah. And hiring great people is part of it. But putting your, your own personal comfort is certainly not a priority. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Interesting you brought up the hiring piece because I think you've definitely built up a reputation as someone that's always operating on 10. So you naturally want to surround yourself with people that are at that level. What are some of the things that you look for to see, okay, does this person have the edge? Because you know you're going to be running all the time. Can they run with you? It's very hard to, you know, resumes or LinkedIn pages, whatever you use, can tell you a lot, but they don't measure resourcefulness or effort, right? So those things do not appear in any aspect of looking at a person's profile. So I've learned through failure, you know, I may have, not I may have, I have, I have, I have hired and fired, you know, 3,000 plus people, you know, so you learn what are the qualities or what are the questions to ask to try to help mitigate that the kind of person you need for your company. It doesn't mean that that person's bad. You could have made a bad hire, not because the person's not good. They just don't fit your team. I mean, you see that in the NBA all the time. Players on somebody that was on the Lakers or somewhere else goes to another team, and then all of a sudden they do well because it's the system, it's the culture, it's the coach. And that's the same thing with employment. Like, you just may be good, just not for this company. So understanding what you specifically need Versus, oh, this person worked at Satekai, or they worked at Google, they worked at Airbnb, we want that. Like, pulling them into a startup or pulling them into that culture or pulling them into that product, not made completely, is completely different, specifically in our case, than what they were doing over there. And not every single job transfers one-to-one. Whether it's the music business, the tech industry, the marketing business, we hire people at Translation all the time. They came from Ogilvy. It's like, well, that has nothing to do with us, right? Or they come from Goodby, and you're like, well, that ain't going to work here, right? Why? Just because the way we're set up, what they may be used to, the programming that they run versus what we run, they, you know, may not be a great culture fit. And so knowing that helps mitigate that risk. So knowing who you are, knowing what kind of people respond well to your culture is an important aspect. Not only just the mission statement stuff, yeah, great, but like really innately knowing it and feeling what works. What are the common attributes of the people that are successful at your company that are more nuance based and knowing how to identify that in others and what other companies share those values so that people that come from those companies tend to do well at your company. You mentioned how this is a tension point in music in this industry. I think we've seen it from time and time, whether it's the record label side and folks of the creative versus streaming and tech coming in and some of the pushback there. I think you've been able to have a good vantage point with both of these because you have a ad agency and you also have a music distribution service. The talents, the skills needed for one may not make sense for the other, but they also have a bit of a unique yeah. identity there. Yeah. How is it with that perspective? Difficult, hard. At the onset of starting United Masters, I put translation in United Masters under United Masters, Inc. And understanding that in order to do that, to build a marketplace that has creative or brands on one side and creative and culture and cultural impact and creators on the other side and building that marketplace takes hiring unique people because we sit at the convergence of culture, technology, and storytelling. Mm -hmm. So you need people who are prolific, at least two of those three things, every single person. And that's the only way you have a shot of getting that convergence to work as one. And hiring for that and building organization structures around that probably is the most important thing that I do every day is understanding where can we be more efficient in that model? What kind of people do we need in order to accelerate that model? How do we scale that model as a result of the talent we have and the talent we need? That is very difficult and it is probably, it's definitely a top 
five priority for, from the CEO. And I assume as well, part of this is required with the nature of how you've positioned United Masters, right? If you don't have these differentiating factors, if you don't have this tie in to culture or trying to present sync opportunities or things like that, then it could easily be seen as another music distribution service. And that's not what- Well, Dan, you've been following the company very closely. Before you could be just another distribution company, before that became popular, I had this idea with that differentiating factor seven years ago, right? So I knew from the onset that distribution was table stakes. And the building of United Masters with translation and power, powering the brand sync opportunities, the influence type of opportunities was something that I had the early vision on. So yeah, it's important, but it's not important in response to, oh, all of these you know, distributors are in the market now, so you need to X, Y, Z. I was doing the X, Y, Z before they even had the idea to be in music distribution, to be honest with you. And a lot of these music distribution companies that you see are coming out are looking at United Masters and honestly copying it. Some of it they can't copy. That's fine. Some of it they can't copy. It's 20 years of experience in, you know, running record companies and building an advertising business to be able to do this. So, you think you can replicate the outcome without replicating the process, which I've never seen actually happen. The theory is right, but to replicate it, to hire the people, to have the credibility in the marketplace, to speak to brands and hire the type of people needed to pull us off, good luck. I do believe, and I, I am supportive, just to add to all of that, great distribution companies that support independent music that have something to contribute to the independent music movement are welcome and everybody, you know, rises as a result of it. So I'm not necessarily, I don't look at these other distributors as competitors. I look at us as contributing to an industry that's changing the music business dramatically. And if you have something to bring to the table, it's beneficial to all. That makes sense. And I think for United Masters as well, you've been able to have your moat, essentially, as you've described it, you have the years of experience, you have the ability to connect dots in ways that others don't. And that's led you to land some of the artists you have. You have a recent deal that's been announced with Brent Fiaz and a long-term partnership there. Can you talk a bit about that deal and how things came together? Well, a moat is a bit of a stretch. I don't know if we have a moat. We have a great business model that certain artists, labels, can find use of. Do you think anyone has a moat in the space? No, no. The record companies, the traditional record companies had a moat when physical distribution was a barrier of entry, right? Not, it's very hard to press up 500,000 CDs or vinyls or whatever mm -hmm. it is and distribute it to 7,000 points of distribution. That's not easy to do for a small, a single individual or a very small business. So that was their moat. They also had a monopoly on radio and, and MTV. You know, MTV doesn't matter at all, and the music per se, radio matters much less than it used to for discovery, right? So they used to have a moat, but no longer do they have a moat. And I don't think anybody in independent music has a moat. I think DistroKid has a lane, and TuneCore has a lane, and United Masses have a lane, and, you know, others have certain strengths about them. But I think the only moat you have is the moat that is a true result of the success that you have. If people choose you and you build a strong business and you're growing, that's the quote unquote moat. But other than that, I don't think anyone has a clear defining advantage that no one else can replicate, right? And just because we have the brand stuff, does it mean that that's the, you know, I wanna believe that's very important to the artist, but somebody else may have another thing that, is marketed well and that's what they think their advantage is. I don't have the ultimate advantage because, you know, brands and brand partnerships and sync may not necessarily be what you find most valuable. Mm -hmm. It could be a distribution company that creates and manufactures merch. And you're like, oh shit, that's the one I want, mm -hmm. right? So I don't want to say that specifically we have that. That's fair. 
I do think that that mentality is part of the differentiating that I think is lost in music overall to some extent, because I think that you have few record labels that truly have unique brands. I think you have few music streaming services that have unique brands. And when you have something, it's clearer to be able to say, who is this for? Who is this not for? Right. And clearly, I assume you're able to do some of that with Brent Baez and that partnership. He yeah. saw something with how you all do business and said, okay, this is for me. Well, well, Brent is a very, very unique talent. Obviously, he wants to be with something that a company, a distributor, a partner that represents values that are dear to him. So creativity is extremely important to him. The fact that we do have translation really matters in that instance because brand partnerships is something that he holds near and dear to him. He also was very respectful of my you know, reputation and what I've accomplished and chose that over others who you know, was offering more money but didn't have the same values that he had or shared values. He didn't share their values. He was very particular about that. Everyone who knows him knows that. He is high taste. So he wanted to be with, you know, a brand, a distributor, a partner that was had a sense of premiumness to it. That was important to him. So I think the combination of those three things and, you know, just our chemistry, his manager Ty is also a fantastic, really intelligent guy who I've developed a great relationship and a lot of respect for. Also played a very significant role in in this partnership. And we're gonna do great things together. I I knew this day would come. I knew where, it, so much respect for guys like, I mean, for Toby, right? Toby Niwi, who I keep screwing up his name and he keeps making fun of it. Me screwing up his name is actually part of his name now. <laughs> when I say <laughs> but uh, I have so much respect for him and Fat because we've done so well together and they've committed to us and we've committed to them and it was a proof point that an independent artist can be successful, can be, you know, a global brand. And I directly tie the work that we've done with Toby and, and others and others. He just comes to mind. I, I spent a lot of time with him for why Brent chose us. Brent chose us. And now you got Brent who sold out his tour in three days around the world and shit. That kind of star deciding to stay independent, not go with a major label. And they offered him everything, all the money in the world. And I, I knew that trend is going to happen. That's going to happen, man. You're going to start seeing this happen all the time. Like, you know, the one moat, again, back to the legacy labels that they have is that because they own your masters, when your contract is up, what they do, their, their thing is start to give you back the shit they took from you, mm -hmm. right? So now you leave, you finish your eight, five, seven album commitment, whatever it is, right? And... It's no longer can they give you any more money to stay. So they go, we'll give you back album one. And you're like, I'll stay on Sony because now album one reverts. Mm -hmm. I'll stay on Universal because album one reverts. So they stay stuck in the system because all they do is now give you back what you shouldn't have never given, actually, or they never should have taken. So they hold you because you're tethered to that, right? Mm -hmm. And no matter what, an independent distributor can't give you your first album that you wrote. Because you never had it in the first never, place. Right, you know, so you never had it in the first place. However, so that's the moat that they have with legacy acts that will stay. So it'll be hard for legacy acts to leave when they can give you back that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But the new artists who are building their careers are considering independent distributors such as myself or others at the same consideration set as they're considering a label. If you can give them money and you can provide them services, look, man, you know, people talk about like, oh, these labels have a service. We picked up our systems. We distributed a song from a great, great young artist, good man, superstar pride out of Mississippi, has a song called Painting Pictures. Mm -hmm. The song was released in October. The song moves like this. Not building, just, I don't know, 3,000 streams a day or something like that. And then all of a sudden on February 6th, it goes from 3,000 to 9,000 or something like that. Our systems catch it, right? We're looking for the second derivative. We're measuring acceleration. Boom, we find it. 
Two or three days later, other labels, it goes from 9,000 to 27,000. And then five days later, it's compounded to fucking 400,000 streams, something in a day. It's crazy. But we already have identified it. All the labels are offering the money. Three and a half million, four million, this, that, and a third. He chose to stay with United Masters. Everybody said, well, they can't get you this. They can't do that. Songs that be number one at radio. It's not like they have an advantage anymore. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's not even like a problem. Mm -hmm. If it was like a heavy lift, the artist made a great song. We got to work it at radio. There's a formula to that. Money is part of that formula, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And we can do it. Somebody can't do it better than us. Universal can't do it better than us. They would like for artists to think that, right? They would like the perception of that to be true, but it's not. The real marketing is coming out of, you know, the artists themselves and your relationships with Apple and Spotify and other distributors and YouTube. And we have the same relationships they have. So the new artists know that. They don't see the only thing the record company can really give them that they believe they can get, that they can't get an independent, is money. And I hope the Brent Fires deal just shows that we have money too. It's like- How big is that money difference? Because I think that's the one thing that people do. It's getting smaller and smaller. As the record companies are losing, they're letting people go. Their margins are getting smaller and smaller. They're firing a lot of people. I don't know if no one talks about this, but they're not running around writing those big ass checks like they used to anymore. Hell no, 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 no. Because I think people will look at a deal like the one that Drake did last year, yeah. for instance, and they'll say the rumored amount was somewhere 300, 400 million. It was million. more than that, much oh. more than that. Okay. But that's different. They have Drake's, remember what I told you? They got Drake's masters. Right. That's different than an artist starting from Drake releasing the first song with Trey Songs, all right, whatever, when he started his career. Like, if Drake released a song today that Drake considers an independent music company at the same rate that he looks at a major label. Because the major label can't say anything to him today that will make him believe outside of money that they have an advantage. This topic, too, reminds me of something similar because we're talking about record labels and streaming services as well, who's bringing in money. And there's all this debate right now around pricing for these services. The record labels want those prices higher. The streaming- the songs? Oh, no, for the monthly subscription that customers oh. pay. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so they want the higher. The streaming services, well, a few of them still want to keep them as low as possible, but we're seeing things trending in that direction, you owning a music distribution service, relying on that streaming revenue as well. Where do you take, what's your take right now on pricing on the consumer side and yeah. yeah. A few things here. Number one, the record companies had the opportunity when they held all of the leverage to control pricing, to control pricing for the customer, as well as the price per stream. All of these things were set up at a time when the record companies, you know, got big advances from Apple, you know, got ownership in Spotify. So they were cool with whatever was going on. As they're starting to lose market share, now they need to go find growth. And the only way to find growth is go to the streaming services and say, charge more money so we can make more money. But the problem is that if the artist got the lion's share of the money, rather than the label getting the lion's share of the money, the current pricing model will work really well. The artist, if they were independent and they were receiving 80% of the money that came from streaming and it went to each individual artist, they'd be fine with it. They'd be making a lot more money than they're making right now. The independent artists are making a fortune of money. Go ask Russ. Go ask Toby. Go ask Brent what he's done for so many years, why he stays independent. Because they've really received the lion's share of money. The record companies have bloated overhead, whether it be office space, employees, and salaries of their CEOs and shit like that. And whether they're public or, or not, in the case of Universal, it's public, they need to show growth. And they're losing margin on how much money they're making per album or release 
And the only way to find growth, real growth, is to diversify their business, which they haven't been so good at. There's not that many entrepreneurs inside of record companies. Jimmy Iovine was one. Dr. Jay-Z was another. But there's not that many. You don't see that many. I'm not making this up. So you're talking about CEOs who were fat and happy, now all of a sudden have to innovate. And they don't have a person that can make beats by Dre. They don't have a person who's going to create the next thing. So now they got to go to Apple and Spotify and squeeze more. The problem is their leverage with Apple and Spotify have sort of gone in the other direction. They don't have as much leverage as they had seven years ago, eight years ago, 10 years ago. So that's the landscape. I believe the artists should get paid more money. That's what we built our model to do. Make sure the artists get paid more money and have great partnerships with the platforms. And that's how I see it right now. Yeah, so to answer your question on pricing, whether or not Spotify or Apple should charge more, I mean, yeah, if they're going to continue to grow so that you don't want to price it so that people start canceling subscriptions, right? You mm -hmm. got to price it right so that it keeps growing because the more they grow, the more the pot of money grows. But before I get to even worrying about what they're charging, I need to worry about the artists are getting the lion's share of the revenue. And that's what we stand for at United right. Masters. And that's what we've been able to accomplish today. And at least for the artists that are part of United Masters, they don't have the rights holder relationships that the signed artists do on the record label. So that side doesn't necessarily affect them as much. I think you definitely address that piece of it. I think the other side of it is looking at streaming prices on all the video services and how Netflix and all these other services have definitely expanded beyond their 999 price point. And then for you all as a business, knowing that a company like Spotify, which does have lower churn than a lot of those other companies as well, if prices were to increase 10%, that's 10% more revenue, at least for the streaming revenue side of the business for a company like United Masters, given the cut you have. Again, yes. And at some point, you can raise the price to the point where somebody says, you know what, I'd rather not do that. I'd rather have a, not that service. I'd rather listen to it free on YouTube or I'd rather deal with ads. It costs too much. I don't know what that price is, but there's absolutely a point of diminishing return in setting any price. You got to just know what that price is. So rather than me sit here and go, yeah, they should raise prices, which I could easily say because it's beneficial to me. I want them to raise prices and continue to grow because as that pot grows, there's more money to be distributed. If they price it wrong, it hurts us. That's my only point. That's fair. I get that. This topic as well reminds me of another thing that I wanted to chat with Everything you about. Everything we're talking about reminds you of something else. That's great. <laughs> but that's how you write. You write like that. You find all these comparisons, different business models. In fact, you know, that's why I'm a fan of what you guys do, of what you do. But it's funny when you say it, actually. This reminds me of <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. I was actually going to say, this isn't a random reminding. This is actually something you had said in that episode of The Shop. I think it was the last one you did. You were, I think Drewski was on there. A few other folks were on there. You yeah. were talking about dollars that were moving from traditional TV yeah. and going towards creators. Yeah and how much of an opportunity that is. And I know you, with the business you have with translation, a lot of your work has been focused on doing these traditional TV partnerships, whether it's with a State Farm or some of the other clients you have. I'm curious to hear how this type of transition impacts your work and what opportunities you see and how you may have be thinking about the future on that side. So the media buying companies, people who buy media for brands, are seeing and advising that television ratings outside of sports are going in the wrong direction. And advising to put that money more into digital channels that are primarily driven by creators. The creators have deep connections with their fans. The creators can create a network effect so you can hire you know, 50 creators who have deep impact in different regions, communities, and you can buy against it and sort of create 
marketplace momentum around a movement, a brand, a product, whatever it may be. My question to Drewski is, this thing is shifting in your direction, or what are you doing to prepare for it? I said something so long ago on uh, my man Sway. I said that artists are going to become mini media channels. I said this six years ago. Mini media channels. If you look at the artists and you look at them like what cable channels were, you watch ESPN, they have an audience. You watch Turner, they have an audience. You watch Discovery, they have an audience. The artists, the influencers are going to be exactly like those with obviously much smaller audiences. But the relationship between the artist and the audience or the influence and the audience is where the media money is going. ESPN, Turner, and Discovery are prepared for that. Their organizations are set up for it. They stay on brand so that when the money comes their way, the brand knows whoever's spending money against it knows exactly what they're getting and the kind of audience that they have. What are the creators doing to be prepared for that movement of revenue coming to them? How are they set up for that? Because in the beginning, it starts to look like, oh shit, this is all found money. But I'm saying this is not just found money. This is the new industry. Is there anyone that you see that's doing a good job of this right now or any creators that are ready for this moment there's that so are doing many, it well? There's so many of them. A lot of YouTube creators are doing it. You know, Mr. Beast, this guy. I mean, you know the names. They all, mm -hmm. you know, have created, you know, products that create lines around the block. I mean, you know, you don't look at it this way anymore because she's transcended what you first seen her as. But Kim Kardashian is that. She's the ultimate influencer. She's the influencer's influencer, right? And she's built billions of dollars of business as a result of using her culture, her influence that started with Instagram and social media. So like, yeah, we've seen a lot of people do it right. The musicians are now starting to do it right because they're starting to realize Rihanna and Fenty and mm -hmm. others are copying or copying or seeing that, look, the streaming business is great. And touring is great, but my impact, my movement, because of my digital footprint, can allow me the opportunity to sell other higher margin items, like beauty products, like lingerie, like footwear. So understanding your influence, whether you're a musician or personality, and who your audience is, creating opportunities for a lot of money to be made. And how does that shape the type of work that translation will continue to do in the future working with creators? Well, our number one responsibility at translation is to be lockstep with culture and lockstep in real lockstep. So as we help provide solutions for brands, creative strategic solutions, we understand that what I just said about where this business is going and the influences and, and their impact that they have, we're very fluent at that. So it doesn't impact us in a way that says, oh, now we have to change our business as a result of this. We just create in these new landscapes, right? Like it doesn't impact us at all. In fact, it hinders the more bigger traditional agencies who have not even wrapped their brain around diversity, culture, they're still running an old playbook. This new thing, they hope, goes away. But we've seen this over and over again, right? It's the dilemma that happens, the innovation dilemma that takes place. And whether you do it yourself or you get disrupted by somebody else, if you hold on to what you've done, you'll be disrupted. When we built translation, we built it under the, the manifesto of translating culture for Fortune 500 companies. And translating always needs to happen. That's why I came up with the name. Everything needs to be translated, right? So the fact that tr culture needs to be translated and because it's translated and, and it changes, you have to be clear and understanding of it. I talk about that all of a sudden, the speed of culture, the speed in which, you know, someone can become an overnight success. Like there's a tape, a footage, you should run it in this spot. I'll send it to you. Where little Nas X goes on, he eats a piece of pizza, January 2019. He's eating a piece of pizza on Instagram. And he's like, yo, this is Nas X. I got 
1,000 plus followers on Spotify. I got 3,000 on Instagram. You know, a couple, you know, thousand views on YouTube. But I think Old Town Road is going to be a hit. And I'll see you guys a year from now. Literally a year to the day. He has on a white fucking mink, eating pizza, and he's like, you know, it's little Nas X, 30 million on Spotify, da da da. And that's no different than Skims disrupting Spanx in a year. Like, that's no different than other, everybody is ready for the, That's the speed of culture. And it's fast, and it'll never be this slow again. Like, that's a fact. So, being a brand, an agency, a creative company, a influencer or whatever you are if you're not aware prepared built for that speed you will get left the other area that's moving just as fast probably even faster is nil and everything happening there with this reminded you of nil you were gonna say that that reminds me of nil oh shit how the fuck did he do that that reminds me of a great piece of pizza i just had steve i got nil deals go ahead yeah yeah and i think we've seen a lot of fast movement there yes we have you've definitely probably see plenty of opportunities because i think the space is very unregulated. There's random things happening. Yeah, and... yeah. You should go look at, just so that you properly, as you definitely know my work and have been very much appreciative of my contribution. I did a documentary at LeBron James called Student Athlete that came out five years ago. You should look at that. You should play clips of it. We, we followed four athletes over a year that were high school, that were college athletes. One of them got injured and fucking like had to sleep in his car because, you know, you're a D1 athlete, you get injured, you don't make it to the pros, you don't get any fucking health insurance anymore, they fucking cut you, that's the end of it, right? So you're playing for this lottery ticket and you don't get shit. And the fact that these student athletes don't get a chance to actually get a great education because they have fucking practice every day or games on Friday or traveling to get to a game all over the place. But the school benefits from all of the advertising dollars mm -hmm. and all of the conference dollars was something that we put a highlight on. And it was really making it and seeing these stories. You felt like this is kind of modern day slavery. Mm -hmm. So, NIL deals, the Wild Wild West, the transfer portal as well. So you got NIL deals right. and the transfer portal happening at the same time. What is this doing? This reminds me of the independent music business. Because now these student athletes really now are independent business people. They can change schools with less friction than they could have five years ago, 10 years ago. Forget it. You change schools, you had to sit out a year, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. By the time you could play, you know, you lost a step or you weren't the same or you were too far removed from the game, whatever it may be. So the hindrance of that made you stay at the school and not go through that problem. That was the way they kept you. Well, it's certainly not fair that the football in which you have to stay three years, right, and basketball pay for 90% of all of the other scholarships mm -hmm. that the fucking sports program have, and yet these guys don't get any money. It's not right. You know, think about players getting th thrown out of bowl games because they got tattoos right. free. It's crazy. So I'm all for NIL deals, and I'm happy it's the Wild Wild West, and I like the fact that there's a guy or girl on campus make, making $2 million a year balling in a fucking Porsche or Bentley or investing his or her money, whatever they're doing, helping their family, I'm happy for it. And the fact that they are getting a chance to monetize their impact beyond a scholarship that is fantastic, but a definitely a education that is not the same because they're practicing the amount of time they're practicing and traveling the way they're traveling. This is the least that they can do is get paid for their services. And 
the NCAA got away with a lot for a very, very long time. You should look at that. Look, when the student athlete, it's a bylaw, right? That actually became a thing and why it was set up that way and what it means and the implications of it. It was a way to hog tie or build a moat so that these kids would never leave. As college sports grew and the money grew, all of a sudden it became these assets right. became really lucrative. These conferences became very lucrative. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars in TV deals. So I'm happy for it. In fact, we represent the Big 12. And shout out to my man, Brett Yormark, who now runs the Big 12. He came from running the Brooklyn Nets. He, I worked with him when he moved the Nets from New Jersey to Brooklyn. Then he went over to run an aspect of Rock Nation. And now he runs the Big 12. He's the future of collegiate sports because he understands the music industry and the brand building industry. He understands the business of running sports team, the Nets, the arena, the Barclays, bringing in talent to fill that arena, pricing, dynamic pricing, media deals. He did it all. And now he's taking that combination of skills to Big 12 and he wants NIL deals. In fact, that's his competitive advantage because none of those guys who run all those other conferences, they're all like, shit, we got to give these NIL deals. The students are going to do X, Y, Z in this transfer portal. What are we going to do? Brett's like, this is what I've been doing my whole career. I, I can't wait to set up NIL programs, bring brands in, you know, treat these students, athletes, like the same way we treated artists in my previous career. He, it's dope. And it's way, way overdue. This it- reminds you of... Didn't remind me of something, but I was going to ask you, is this an area that you would work more directly in through translation, through the agency, working with the top Yeah, athletes? I mean, yes. I, I, look, it's not like, again, we represent the Big 12, so our contribution to that is adjacent to a lot of that kind of stuff. You know, there is an opportunity to set up a division that works specifically on NIL deals. I think it's much more urgent that The CAAs do and the UTAs and the WMEs have that because they're brokers of that kind of stuff where they have Mm -hmm. talent and they brands and they put them together. We do that for our clients. We don't do that as an industry trade. We don't just like connect random brands with, you know, artists unless we are or athletes unless we are doing much more immersive experiences and creative for those brands. But, you know, I'm happy we represent Beats. We did the Beats deal with Bronny. Then we did the commercial with Bronny and his dad, LeBron. And like, I love that. I love it not only for that story, but the fact that, again, this 17-year-old kid signed a deal with Beats. And we can actually market that and advertise that as without him losing eligibility or whatever the fuck these guys were coming up with is dope. Right. Especially given that everyone was going to make money off of his name. So I'm glad he can do it himself. Of course. Like, you speak to Jalen Rose about this, like, when they're at Michigan, man, the Fab Five, and these guys are Oh, that was bad. It's terrible, man. Yeah. Selling jerseys with their name on it, and these guys, like, everybody's looking and investigating to what they did, and what did Weber do, and what he did to try to feed his family. You can't even afford to get your family to come see you play. Mm Mm-hmm. Of course corruption's going to be in it. You mean, I can't eat. I have a scholarship, though. And my parents can't even come see me play because we can't afford it. You don't think that's going to lead to corruption? Are you crazy? It's this weird juxtaposition where I think either Weber or Rose talked about this in that documentary. The coach, by the way, yeah, gets paid ten million dollars in most towns or cities in America. The highest paid employee of that city or town is the coach of the football team. Yep, or the basketball team. They're the highest earning person in the entire city. Yeah. They, and I'd save at the state level, too, get, for the colleges. Get, then they get deals with Nike, and the coach makes the player wear Nikes or Reeboks or whatever it is. The coach makes that decision. Everyone's making money except the student themselves. But they're getting a scholarship. Right. Right? It's crazy. And a, definitely an education with an asterisk next to it. Isn't that fair? Are you fucking out of your mind? It's crazy. It's crazy. I'm glad... This is happening, and I'm glad we're seeing this shit. Yo, pull up student athlete. When you do this, I'm giving you the edit right now. I'm going to send you the little Nas thing and the student athlete thing. Oh, yeah, we'll throw it in there. Put it in 
That's why we're doing video. Yeah. No, yeah. that's why. No, this will be good. And then we have the clips and everything. Yeah. Shifting gears. Last time you were on, you talked about chief technology officers and why artists need to have tech side Come on, folks brother. on yeah, their platform. Brother, yeah, brother. Yeah. How have you seen this develop in the past couple of years since? I haven't. The artists that obviously have, the foundational truth is, as technology is becoming much more important in content and video services, every artist needs a chief technology officer. That's the foundational truth. The practical reality is that that's not gonna be the case, which is the opportunity for platforms like ours to be extremely useful in providing tools, intelligence, information that is allows the artist, the influencer, to take action in a very user-friendly way to help grow their career. So essentially, we want to be the chief technology officer as a platform for all of these artists. I believe that to be true. In fact, in building our platform, the remit to my engineers is that, that we have to anticipate what the artist's needs are and build that for them. We're building it for a community of artists. We're not building it to best interface with Apple or Spotify or YouTube, that's one part of it. 80% of it is, what do you, I say all the time, man, I'm about to put my name in the system. I'm about to upload my first song. That experience, if I nail this, I'm gonna change the life of me and my mama. I'm gonna become my dreams. I'm gonna be able to quit this bullshit job and really live out what my talents are when I hit this button and upload this song, that's how they feel to build the technology that's empathetic to that. And then as they continue to grow, make sure that they have the tools and they need information in order to do their thing. That's what I tell each and every engineer that comes into my company. That trajectory makes sense because if you're starting out, you're independent, you're not gonna have the resources to hire someone to pay them 150, yeah. 200 a year, whatever it is, to yeah. be a CTO on staff. Yeah. How can you leverage the partnerships you have? Maybe if you get to a certain point, you can have someone internally. Uh, of course, but... of course, you know, Drake and you know, Beyonce and Pharrell, and they have a version of a chief technology officer, somebody who their interaction with technology is seamless and smooth and they understand it and they have relationships and, you know, they could speak with the tech leaders and, and be able to find the value and where the integration and partnerships can, can best take form. Up until you get to that point, we should be the platform to provide that for you at scale. Artists as well, this is also valuable because there's so many new things that are always coming. Obviously, I talk about them often in Trapital. You're evaluating themselves for your own business, whether it's a couple of years ago, whether or not we should be building something on the blockchain. A couple of years after that, should we be involved with Web3? Should we have NFTs? And 2023, AI yeah, yeah. is the big thing. Can I talk to you about that? Yeah. But, but ask the question, I'll get into it. Yeah, so I was gonna ask twofold, how you look at it for yourself with the businesses, and then also the value add and advice you give to artists that are considering the same. Yeah. So let's I take a step back for a second. Whether 20 years ago, as technology, you know, sort of more consumer facing technology 30 years ago has been is taking shape, it is taking shape. The popularity of code or the popularity of, you know, technology outside of just the internet itself. It wasn't a media frenzy around it. It didn't, like, it was just happening. It wasn't, like, front and center of the media. And I think part of it is, like, there weren't that many day traders. Like, Uber drivers are traders and school mm -hmm. teachers trade. Everybody's trading stocks. So now that you've built applications that allow people to day trade and everybody could be a stock analyst themselves, the technology has gotten a lot of media attention. And a lot of that media attention... I do believe has escalated the fact that it becomes top of mind, but yet the application of that technology may be premature. Agreed. So 
Every, the metaverse. Oh my God, everybody's doing in the metaverse. We're in the metaverse. We're in the metaverse. You in the metaverse? What is the metaverse? Is Fortnite the metaverse? That's not the metaverse. The Oculus is the metaverse. No, that's not the metaverse. Is gaming in general the metaverse? Well, whatever. But before we could even get to that, NFTs come. Well, fuck the metaverse. It's the NFTs. Well, the NFT, you got an NFT, you got a, what's your character? What's your character? You got a character, what's your character? What's your meta I don't have mask? A oh, that's Let me see your crypto wallet. What's in your crypto wallet? What's in your crypto wallet? What's in your crypto? Okay, now we just went to the, oh shit, fucking AI. You use chat GBT? How are we going to, it's like, yo, bro, could we just chill out? Stop. <laughs> and the media writes it, and then everybody just runs around thinking that they need to be prolific and like force themselves to find the application because they don't want to be left out. Like, let these things find use cases that stick and therefore the products and the applications that come out of it will then take hold. But like for you to just run to crypto wallets and metaverses and AI and it's like, it is so overblown. And what I was telling my team about is what happens is like, let take crypto. The media is incentivized to write it all the way up, right? Write it all the way. You got to get this. You got to get this. You got to get this. They write it all the way up. And then as soon as the shit melts, they fucking write it all the way down. So they still win because they fucking made everybody feel like it was important. And then they start shitting on it. And everybody has to read that because they want to know why they're shitting on it. And then while they're shitting on it, They've picked the next thing. <laughs> Metaverse. Da, 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 da. It's like, it's funny to me because I could, it's obvious actually. It's funny because it's obvious, but yet people sort of work themselves up like, you know, I deal with CMOs all the time. They're like, you know, what are we going to do in the Metaverse 18 months ago? They don't even fucking bring it up anymore. Right. Why were you bringing it up 18 months ago? Because you read it in the New York Times? Because it was on some news channel? And you don't even bring it up anymore. The dialogue around this heightened the FOMO. Everyone has the fear of missing out. Not me. All this. Not me. I think I don't have any FOMO on shit that's not real. And I'm not saying it's not real. I'm saying until it has practical applications that affect my life or my business, really. How do you determine what that is? I don't know. Talent? Testing? I don't know, like that kind of thing. It's interesting, right? Because I feel like we could go back to two years ago. And I remember, I think that was around the time that NFTs were having their craze. And artists could have been like, oh, well, what if we could release an NFT yeah. on United Masters or something like that? Yeah. Or what if we could do this? And it's one of those things in hindsight, of course, the right answer is, yeah, that I don't think we need to do that. I Let's never, stay the course. You ask anybody who worked with me, I never, ever bought that bullshit. I'm like, look, until that young kid, that 17-year-old kid, 16-year-old kid in Atlanta, Fort Lauderdale, Los Angeles, is showing me that they're willing or want to buy an album as an NFT, I am not going to allow Discord chatter to say, that's where my business is going. I think that's a good example here because so much of the chatter around this stuff is hyped up by people that are in it people that were buying nfts or music related nfts or things like that were people that were talking about this on the regular on discord and twitter but it's not the Bro, 14 year old guy, you know and he's my man but he owns royal oh blau blau yeah. right you know he put out an album right you know mm -hmm. oh yeah i remember that, that, that 11 million story. in a mm -hmm. right dj and then Nas had done something yeah. on Royal a so couple months later. Royal, yeah. right? But if you, so Blau, very smart, very, very smart. Made $11 million on an album. Everybody was like, that's the example. NFT is the whole thing. When you ask people, like regular fans who are fans of DJs that listen to EDM music, and you say, you know that album, Blau? They don't even know what you're talking about. That album that did that was purchased primarily by people that was in that business, the Discord community. It wasn't the general music community that bought it or even was aware of it. It was the people in that community. That's fine. That's fine. That's good for him. It's good for that community. Perfect. But to try to say that that applies to every 
the industry at large now. And now the 16-year-old kid in Atlanta, Miami, Chicago, whatever, is going to not want that. That's not the right idea. And, you know, it didn't require testing and learning for that. You could just do the work on it, do the math on it. Now, there's aspects of the NFT. The blockchain technology, I think, is very important for payments. Yeah. So I see that application. Everything has an application. It's like AI is gonna, it's fantastic. NFTs and crypto and all of this, fan, the metaverse, fantastic. I just think this accelerated frenzy and FOMO sometimes get you to lose focus on what about it is really important to your business. Mm -hmm. And what I learned in the frenzy of the NFT marketplace or Web3 was the value of blockchain to payments. Payments in the music industry are very it's difficult because you have many people contributing to a song and the rights holders need to have something that bound them, right, on these digital forever, right, until they decide to change it. And the blockchain does really good with those agreements in being able to put, you know, 17 people writing one song, whether it be a sample or just original writers, whatever it may be, and allow them to have these digital contracts that make sure everybody gets paid fairly, precisely, automatically. That part of it, I like. I mean, for my business, I like all of it, mm -hmm. but specifically for our business. Does anything about AI spark interest or application in the same way? Well, so with, with AI, I'm trying to figure out, I really like it for education. So, you know, if I'm giving you tools, look at Uber, right? They tell a driver, you know, peak times, 4 p.m., this area, the town, the driver know where to go. The driver could be of any education level, but the tools that are provided to that driver apply to, you know, whether you speak perfect English, you know, you're learning English, your education level varies. The simplicity of what they provide you to be a small business is absolutely brilliant. You should look at the back end of an Uber. You should see what an Uber driver sees. It'll amaze you. For our artists, I look at them like that. So where I think AI can be really good is in understanding, like when you post during this time, this is when the best time you get results. This is the type of content that works best for you. The you know, really release of songs, when you should release them, the timing of it. I think utilizing AI to provide education around building your business can be very helpful for us because of the fact that it can pull all that information and then provide a very easy way of understanding the best way to move forward based off the intelligence that it gleams. There's so many applications of it, I think, both internally for companies, like you mentioned, but also how you deal with your stakeholders, how they then deal with their fan bases. It would also be interesting to see just the bigger picture, what that next big thing is, how people are going to react to it. A lot of it is accelerated by how people live in bubbles themselves in a lot of ways. If you're only spending your time on Twitter, on Discord, you're just seeing the frenzy. You think everyone is there with you. Yeah. I remember a year ago, I was at a dinner and this was right at the height of Web3. It was a lot of industry professional folks in there. And I remember being the person saying, you're all saying that we're gonna be on Web6 a year from now. There's people, the average person really isn't tapped into this. I don't think we're moving that fast. And a lot of them looked at me like I was crazy then. Yeah. And I'm like, it's my job to follow this stuff. I'm not a Luddite here telling you this. This is just the reality, so. Well, people, a lot of times people find, try to solve problems that don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> right, like, it's like, you're saying Web6 and all that, but we haven't even gotten to, you know, Look, we still don't even know what the fuck 5G does yet, right? <laughs> Let's be really analog about this topic. Yeah, we're fixing that with AT&T. But just in general, the regular general consumer, you ask them about 5G, they see it on their thing, they're like, my text didn't go through any faster, and my videos are still, you know, it's, right. yeah, it's still like cycling. So I thought I had 5G. So sometimes things create more media momentum than the practical consumer experiences. And a lot of times, people spend a lot of time trying to solve problems that actually don't exist. Agreed on that, agreed on that. Well, Steve, before we close things out, the first interview we did, we talked about where United Masters was, where the future was, and I believe you I told me- Did I do pretty me, good when I look? 
I haven't seen the interview since, but I don't know if I did pretty good in my prediction. Do you, you, you said we're in the first inning of this, because I think I asked you, what does the future look like with exits and future? And you said we're in the first inning. We're early in this perspective. What inning do you feel like we're at now? And what do you see for the future of the business? I believe that we're still in the first third of the innings. I think we're in inning two, bottom of the second, you know, top of the third kind of thing. And the reason why is because now money is coming back in the music. When I first sat with you, there was no VC money in music businesses anymore. They'd fucking ran. They lost all that money with all those other, you know, versions of this idea for reasons that make perfect sense that the money had dried up. The money was going to social media and, you know, FinTech and a bunch of other things like why meet why music. And in the last five years, whether it be catalog sales or independent music now being discovered by financial systems, Goldman Sachs and the others, mm -hmm. investors, more mainstream investors have realized that there's growth there and there's globalization of music and all of the things that bring energy back to the industry and that the record labels don't have this chokehold on it like they used to have. And it's not as difficult and to understand, which was another thing that people didn't understand about the music business. They made it so difficult. People thought it was like a business that was so hard to figure out and all that other kind of stuff right. because of the rights. But because it's now become clear where I used to have to explain it to every single person. They're like, so you're competing with Spotify? Like, no, <laughs> you'd have to explain. Mm -hmm. They understand it now, which is cool. So now money's coming in which means more entrepreneurs are gonna come in and build services like ours and other alternative services, tools. The fastest growing segment of the music business is independent music. The fastest growing aspect of the music business is global music. Mm -hmm. Global music, the record companies never dominated because English speaking music was the only thing that really mattered. I mean, you just think about it. Bad Bunny headline Coachella. Right. How many people don't even know what the fuck he's saying? I mean, if there's 80,000 people there with maybe 65,000 don't know what the fuck he's saying, yet they're dancing. All this great music coming out of Africa mm -hmm. that people are just going crazy over. That never happened at the rate this is happening. Now, all of that, independence rising, globalization and music rising, and money coming in mm -hmm. is now you're about to see the acceleration of what can happen as a result of the momentum. It was always headwinds. And now I would say in the last year, it's been tailwinds. It's an exciting time. It's a very exciting time. It's extremely exciting time. It's no longer in the dark. It's no longer something that, you know, big business it wasn't paying attention to. Everybody sees it now. And when everybody sees opportunity and money and value creation and the fact that you can disrupt this, you know, $100 billion business or the music business, it can be disrupted because the barriers of entry has completely been removed. Like every other industry where the barriers of entry has been removed, money goes into it, entrepreneurs come into it, and new value is created. And I think that's being recognized as we speak to here today. So we're in the bottom of the second, top of the third. Nice. All right, bro. Appreciate that. Thank you. Always. As always. Always, my man. This is good stuff, man. All right, Trapital. Let's rock and roll. Yes, sir. All right, man. Bye. Cool.